Uh, this is a, an enormous uh, effort to make to try to figure out how to make this transformation, how to find a pathway to get from where we are, which is in the neighborhood of 80 to 90 percent based on fossil fuels, to some number much lower. Uh, three years ago, we undertook a project in which we were looking at the transformation of the U.S. economy and dubbed that uh, the search for a secure low-carbon pathway. We recently undertook a project uh, with the MacArthur Foundation. Um, the project was called Asia's Response to Climate Change and Natural Disasters. There were a few copies out on the side table that you can take, but we'd probably better to take it um, and download it, in which we tried to apply that concept <coughs> to a number of countries in Asia, including China, and realized that it was actually a helpful way to think about this question, to think about the key issues that uh, you have to face in making this transformation of your economy. As a result of that, we continued the project with funding uh, from the Energy Foundation, and we do very much appreciate their support, to look specifically at China in greater depth and try to understand what are the key drivers and interests that will shape the pathway for China's energy future. And I think there's no reason to think that this audience doesn't understand fully well that that's probably the key issue in looking in the future in terms of energy and climate is what are the choices that China will make and what are the policies that they will follow. So we're really um, excited about the program we have today. Um, we have as our, our keynote speaker, Zhang Keijun, who will be joining us later, has been doing an extensive amount of uh, modeling work on the Chinese economy to look at the trade-offs and look at the ways in which to um, achieve a secure low-carbon pathway. But we also wanted to talk about some of the issues in more detail, and that's what our two panels will be um, doing um, to this morning and then this afternoon. Um, this morning, uh, we've got a great lineup of people. We added one to the agenda um, that uh, we were uncertain whether um, he was going to make it. So we've got a very full panel, so I would encourage our panelists to um, be brief. I, I, I heard about this uh, new program of uh, 20 slides and uh, 20 seconds per slide. I don't know if you can quite uh, achieve that, but uh, that gives you six and a half minute presentations. But we'll give you a little bit longer than that. I'm, I'm only kidding, guys. Don't, don't suddenly get worried. Um, our first speaker, um, and the bios are, are there and available, so I won't go through all of the, the details, um, but we wanted to touch on some of the key uh, low-carbon um, uh, strategies in the first panel. So the first speaker uh, is Kate Jackson, Senior Vice President of Research and Technology with Westinghouse, to talk about nuclear, um, nuclear power in China. And Westinghouse, of course, is extremely well-placed, having been awarded uh, for um, uh, contracts to start building a new generation of technology um, in China. So, Kate, why don't you go ahead and start? And are you queued up here? Okay. This one? Okay, good morning. Um, I want to first thank CSIS. These programs are really wonderful. It's a great opportunity to get a range of people who have interests in multiple topics from different perspectives to come together. And I think that's what's so powerful about these, these conversations. So um, good morning. I'm Kate Jackson. I have only recently re-entered the nuclear industry. I've been with Westinghouse two times now. I'm a retread like many folks at Westinghouse. Uh, started at the early part of my career, went off to the Tennessee Valley Authority for about 17 years and now have been back a couple of years. And so I'm kind of relearning the nuclear industry as, as I go. Um, I'm just going to give some brief kind of background material. Uh, the world population is going to increase 25 percent in the next 20 years. Clearly, that's an enormous growth in energy, energy requirements. Um, in the United States and in many developed uh, Western world uh, countries, much of the demand is because we buy more things that are powered with electric uh, power. I wandered around here this morning trying to find a place to plug my computer in, and there are, no, there are hardly any plugs in this room. Um, but so our demand is, is fairly predictable, whereas in the other countries that are rapidly developing, like uh, China and India, 
the growth is unimaginable. The access to electricity is so powerful, so necessary, um, and driven by all kinds of things that we can't predict. And the cars is my is my example. Um, there are going to be 100 million new vehicles by 2020 in China. Obviously, uh, driving those not on gasoline but on electricity will dr dramatically change the profile of how GDP electricity consumption will change over time. Um, that energy consumption by 2030 and the worldwide is expected to increase by 45 percent. Um, in China, the energy demand through 2030 is going to increase as much as 95 percent with a compounded annual growth somewhere between 2.8 and 4 percent. That's 40 percent of the total world energy demand is going to be based in China. And because that's such an important component of energy demand, clearly the, the issues in China are astonishing. Um, they'll roughly, between now and 2030, double their consumption of coal, more than 50 percent increase consumption of coal, more than double their consumption of oil, and almost double global um, greenhouse gas emissions. And at that point, China will account for roughly 28 percent of the global emissions. And so obviously, um, looking for low emission um, platforms for for that, that growth in the economy is critically important. The China electricity sources are similar to the world sources. Uh, fossil is 70 percent, oil is 20 percent, hydro is 6, um, gas is 3 percent, nuclear is 1 percent. It's not very large. So it's, although it, it is a significant investment in China, the energy consumption is so large that it's not a huge percentage. Um, the China Green Energy commitments in um, the Copenhagen conference really were focused on reduction of CO2 per GDP. So it's kind of a, um, a density uh, indicator of 40 to 45 percent through from now until 2020. And the energy plan said that new energy, meaning non-fossil energy, will be increased dramatically. That's renewables. Um, that's all kinds of you know smart grid technology, grid grid technology itself, um, and increased nuclear capacity dramatically by 2020. Pressurized water reactors, which is what Westinghouse designs, sells, develops, maintains, fuels, uh, will be mainstream, but not the only reactor type. And very important to China is having indigenous capability. So it's the ability to fuel those reactors in country, build the the um, all the components be able to construct and maintain those plants. Domestic manufacturing plants are going to be maximized. So the whole plan is to develop self-reliance and then eventually begin to um, compete internationally. Nuclear itself in China, there are currently 12 operating units, two uh, pressurized heavy water reactors, and 10 operating pressurized water reactors, and 24 under construction and several more to commence fairly shortly. Four units by Westinghouse. There are two at Tenmen and two at Haiyang. I'll show a map in just a moment. Uh, by 2020, uh, forecasted to be somewhere between 50, uh, 80 gigawatts operating and 50 gigawatt electric under construction. A gigawatt electric is roughly one large power unit. So, you know, the 24 there will be online, 80, um, total operating by 2020 and 50 more by under construction. And then 200 plants uh, operating by 2030 and 400 plants operating uh, by, tr by 2040. So um, total world nuclear right now is about 440 plants. It's, it's huge, that's huge, the, the program that China has. So what influenced um, the People's Republic of China's decision to consider the AP-1000, which is the design that Westinghouse, um, the new design that's just been licensed um, and is the first design, Gen 3 plus plant that has been certified by the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So part of it is that it's advanced nuclear technology. China has some Gen 2 and Gen 1 plants, which are older plants, um, large loop type plants. And they very much wanted to begin to uh, base their next phase of growth and then their indigenous capability and then their competitive capability based on the next generation, so that generation three. 
Um, they, the new passive safety features I will speak about in a moment um, led to a smaller design, simplified uh, lots of changes in the design itself to make it safer and easier to operate. The smaller nuclear island, uh, the smaller number of safety components, and what that does is drives less risk in the supply chain, it drives easier construction, easier maintenance, standard maintenance. Um, and fundamentally, a different approach to construction, which I'll show in just a minute, but it's have modules, almost like our children play with Legos. It's a new way of constructing a plant, and I cannot overemphasize how different this is. When our customers who have built and maintained plants in the United States for 50 years come and watch the new design, um, they're astonished that it is not reinforced concrete, it's not stick built, doesn't have to be uh, redesigned for every plant site. Um, you build Lego chunks, equipment already in them, and you, you fab them on site and put them together. Um, all of this reduces the schedule and cost. Um, also critical to the selection of Westinghouse in China was our willingness to uh, buy where we build. That's always been our strategy. We don't come to a country with a giant supply chain already linked to us. What we do is look for where we can localize that supply sourcing. Um, that was critical for the, the Chinese decision because of their goals of indigenous capability. And so as they looked at Westinghouse and our history in transferring technology to France, transferring technology to Korea, um, clearly we had a, a track record for the ability to do that. And that was very important. And so there's a whole separate contract. There's the contract for the plants. There's a whole separate contract for, for trans, uh, tr technology transfer. And that's not just with us. Our construction partner and part owner, Shaw, company also has a technology transfer to transfer the architect engineering construction and building technology. Um, also, it's the, was the existing AP1000 was already designed, had a design certification from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which was very important to the Chinese Nuclear Regulatory Group, and working, they're working very closely together. Um, lots of flow of information, obviously, from the NRC to China, but now, as the construction is ongoing, site safety, site inspection, construction inspection, um, turning those drawings into reality in construction, um, in concrete, um, lots, there's lots of information flowing back back to the NRC with respect to how things are going, how that construction process is ongoing. I know that was more than 20 seconds for that slide. Um, okay, so here's a picture of the AP1000. Um, it is the safest, most economic nuclear power plant now available. It's a simplified design, as I said, um, enhanced by the use of passive safety systems. Okay, I've said that. Well, what the heck does that mean? It means things like gravity. It means natural circulation, much like when you uh, have a teacup that the heat, the, the hot comes up to the surface, cools off, and then it flows back down. The cooler tea flows back down to the bottom and sets up a natural circulation cell. The cooling in any emergency, postulated emergency, would be based on things like the heavier water, because cooler flows downward, cools the containment. Um, con condensation, um, convection cools the containment. You need um, many fewer pieces of equipment and uh, fewer emergency systems as a result of all of these. Spent, we spent roughly a decade um, proving that gravity would work in these complex systems to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It's a completely new way to uh, manage a design to manage postulated accidents. And so there was lots of integrated testing that had to go on to say, okay, well, this isn't going to be driven by uh, pumps and valves and have lots of motors and extra things. As you eliminate all those things, you got to continue to prove that the safety is achievable. So this plan is 1,100 megawatts. Um, clearly, engineers named the plant. AP 1,000, it's 1,117 megawatts. Um, so it's two-loop plant. And it's very um, small footprint, so things are, are very carefully designed for operability and maintainability. So the key factor is to standardize a design that's simplified. And it's, the design itself is simple, so um, all the passive safety features allowed, as I said, um, lots of engineered safety systems to go away. Um, there's no off-site uh, power that's required for 72 hours after any postulated accident. That means you don't need diesel generator for safety. You don't need all those pumps and valves and, and piping. Um, 
significant safety. Uh, the water that cools the containment is in a giant tank up above the plant. So if there were an incident, that would by, direct, by gravity drain down and cool and flood the, um, the reactor cavity. Construction is simplified through modularization, which I mentioned a little bit ago. Also procurement. So as you standardize these plants, you're picking from a bin that has SKUs in it that you know you can fill. So there are st all those standard parts or pieces are taken so you can simplify that whole supply chain. All your suppliers then can simplify what they do because there aren't parts that are different for every single unit. And that's the way existing nuclear plants are. Um, in working for the Tennessee Valley Authority in the heyday of nuclear, um, TVA ordered one of every kind of plant it could possibly have. And so it was there as a federal agency to demonstrate that nuclear power could work. And so there was a, a regular pressurized water reactor. There was a fancy ice containment that had ice down in the shield between the two layers of the containment building. There was a boiling water reactor. 17 other reactors were planned, all of which later were canceled. But it was every plant's different. So you can't train staff with one set of standard operating procedures. There, you don't share lessons as easily from one unit to another or from one utility to another. So the whole plan here is to have standard, almost cookie cutter plants. That's true in China. The plants that we've sold in the United States will be exactly the same. So we've also sold six in the United States and some of that construction is currently ongoing in the Southeast. Um, so simple, I keep saying simple. So the fewer resources that you use, the more environmentally sustainable the design. Clearly having nuclear not have emissions with respect to sulfur dioxide and, and nitrogen dioxide and all of the, the greenhouse gas emissions is important. But as you look at this slide, you can see that not using as many components is important as well. So 50% fewer valves, 35% fewer pumps, 80% less pipe. 45% less seismic building volume, which is a huge issue, particularly in countries like China where construction is, is going so fast that the availability of high quality concrete sometimes is critical path. 80% um, less cable. And then the little embedded drawing in the upper right hand corner shows the footprint of a generation two old style Westinghouse pressurized water reactor design compared to an AP1000. And so it's just a smaller footprint. It takes up less land. Um, it takes up fewer resources. It's easier to site. So I talked about the modularization. Um, construction is, uh, is forecasted to be 50 months and then another six months to get the plant synced with the grid and, and all thoroughly tested. Um, that's about three years faster than the average construction historically. And the reason that that's possible is you can see sort of two pathways here. The bottom one is you license the site and you begin to do all the site work, all the surveying, uh, water intake structures, uh, roads, uh, base mat, all those things can be worked in parallel with a modular plant that builds bits and pieces of these modules, ships them to site either by boat or, crane, or, or train or uh, truck, and then a fabrication facility is built to prefab those modules, and then they're lifted into place like the Lego blocks that I said. So one of the beauties of this is that if you get behind because you're struggling with preparing the concrete that you're going to begin to load the modules on, you can still be building modules so you can make up that construction schedule and you're not working always in serial and that's that's very powerful. The China projects themselves, okay, there's a little map. Um, the Haiyang project is there just south east of Beijing and then Sanmen is south, uh, mostly south of uh, Shanghai. Four units, uh, two at each of those locations. The first two units, um, there's, there's uh, Sanmen 1, Delayed by six months is Haiyang 1, then delayed by six months is Sanmen 2, delayed by six months is Haiyang 2. And so we're just kind of rolling through all of these projects. And um, there, the first two units will be operational in 2013, and then two units are operational in 2014, and we are on time and on schedule um, and on cost. And that's a new thing for the nuclear industry. <laughs> 
And as we see some of our competitors, you know, people constantly say, you know, do you look at your competitors and if they're struggling with schedule and cost, is that a good, you know, does that make you feel good? No, it makes us feel terrible because any place that there's a struggle with <laughs> nuclear, um, you know, we all have to address the issues or the lessons that they're learning or what the challenges are that those organizations are facing. So we don't ever want to hear anybody's late. Uh, we just want to be a little better than our competitors. Um, I mentioned how important technology transfer was. Um, it was really a cornerstone of the negotiations in China. And we are um, transferring our technology to the State Nuclear Power Technology Corporation. And it's, it is the most significant and advanced. I mean, it's, it's everything. We constantly have Chinese nationals working with us in the United States at the manufacturing plants, at our supply chain plants, and then also working with their staff and training staff in China. Um, it is the goal of the Chinese, um, this Chinese company, to be able to extend the design into a 1,400 megawatt plant, a 1,700 megawatt plant, some in conjunction with us and some not. There will be follow-on plants. There are already eight of them planned. Um, there will probably be you know, many of those 200 more plants will be AP1000s um, or AP1400s. However, our scope, Westinghouse scope, decreases over time so that we are eventually not providing uh, scope services other than potentially as a subcontractor. So clearly, as all those plants are there, we provide services, we provide fuel, we want to participate, and we are working to establish joint ventures with companies in China to be able to do that. Um, but the whole range of things from nuclear island design and engineering to instrumentation and control uh, to fuel operation and maintenance, uh, core design and uh, manufacturing, cladding parts for the, for the fuel, and also architect engineer technologies. These are just some pictures. Um, the reactor vessel set uh, in the upper left-hand side, set in three rings and a bottom piece and a top piece. Um, very different than the, the welded, on-site welded, each panel separately. Um, the bottom right picture shows one of the continuous pours of the base mat concrete. Those are 50-hour pours. And the first one that we did, there, was, there were absolutely no cracks in it whatsoever. Suggests great technology transfer, great working with the Chinese folks who are working on site, good design, lots of preparation. The second pour was six hours shorter. The third pour at the third site was shorter. So every time the Chinese and we are improving how, how we're building these plants. I just want to show a video to show that it really is different. This is a, um, one of the 276 modules that there are. There are 122 structural modules and 154 piping and mechanical equipment modules. This one is the CA-20. It's the largest module. It's a, that's as big as a five-story building. It weighs 256, 856 tons. You can see the big counterweight there on the giant crane. There are some tiny little people running around in there. Um, so you can get a bit of sense of scale. So some of these modules have steam generators in them. They have pipes in them. They have cable traces in them. They, and they get set in pieces one after another. And the module is built on site at the module factory. Um, it's just in, incredibly different. It's a, it, very exciting. Um, so the second one of these CA-20s that was built was built in significantly less time than the first one. The second uh, containment vessel head placement was significantly faster than the first one. And so transferring those lessons learned is going to be really important. Um, I've talked about the lessons learned. Um, each, each thing that we've done, the base mat pours, the uh, ultra-large steam generator forgings and reactor vessel forgings were done in significantly less time. Um, there are challenges, though. So sharing those lessons learned among those sites. Um, we have multiple customers in China sharing among them, recognizing that each of them is trying to stake out a, a territory for competition in the future internal to China, but also establishing platforms for competition over the long term. Uh, staffing requirements, educating folks in China that can operate, can maintain, understand the material science, quality engineers. Um, so that's ongoing. And just the sheer magnitude of construction, moving that many people and cranes and 
getting the steel availability is clearly a challenge. Just a couple of words about Westinghouse. Um, we provide fuel, fuel services, operation plant services worldwide. Um, we are only nuclear. The, those of you who have Westinghouse televisions, that's not us. Westinghouse <coughs> Christmas lights, that's not us. We constantly get them back at this time of year when they're not working, um, but unfortunately that's no longer us. We don't own the Circle Bar W brand, we just own the nuclear space of it. Um, nearly 50%, 50 percent, 50, 50 percent of nuclear power plants in operation worldwide and nearly 60 percent in the United States are based on Westinghouse technology. There are 15,000 employees. We've hired about 1,800 people every year for the past five years. There are about 750 planned to hire this year in 17 countries around the world. So someone said to me, well, you know, I really want to work for Westinghouse, but I don't want to work in Pittsburgh. I said, okay, have your choice. You can pretty much go anywhere. Um, there are four product line services to keep op plants operating, uh, shorten outages, improve the amount of power that you get out of plants, extend plant life, nuclear power plants, which is the new plant business, nuclear fuel, which is all about provision of fuel and decreasing fuel leakers, having better and better fuel. Westinghouse provides fuel for roughly every kind of reactor that there is. Gas reactors, Russian reactors, uh, beat, uh, boiling water reactors, our competitors' uh, reactors and our own. We own roughly 50% of the fuel market. Um, we're also working on advanced reactors. I talked about the 1400 and 1700 in conjunction with China. In addition, looking at high temperature gas reactors, uh, burner reactors that are fast spectrum reactors, um, and then a small passive plant. I'm gonna skip that one, and I'll skip that one. So that's it, thank you. Uh, thanks, Kate. That was, that was great. Um, I would uh, encourage you to uh, keep notes of questions you want to ask the different speakers because we do have a number of speakers and it's quite a wide range of uh, topics. So by the time we get through the last one, you may have forgotten uh, where we were. Our next speaker is Kong Wu, who is with the East West Center uh, in Hawaii. Uh, Kong is a leading expert on oil and gas industry in China, and we thought it would be useful to have him talk a little bit about the unconventional gas um, discussion that's going on in China now. As you know, in the U.S., unconventional gas has really changed the picture. And so the real question, and many people believe that China can have a similar experience. And we thought that perhaps Kong could uh, help us to understand where things stand and, and what do we know. So. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Davey. Um, I am very happy to uh, to be here and for uh, at the invitation of the CSIS to share my views with you. And uh, as David mentioned, I, I cover a bunch of issues in China, uh, particularly oil and gas. Uh, today, that uh, for a short period of time, what I'm going to do is, uh, uh, you know, today's uh, um, the topic is supposed to be low carbon uh, potentials for China. So we look at the natural gas and conventional gas as one of the sources of the um, uh, the, the potentials. Of course, this is not entirely carbon free, and we are all are, um, aware of that. Um, that's why, you know, um, uh, for, for what I, uh, in the next few minutes, uh, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I, I uh, kind of update you a little bit about the current situation of the unconventional gas in China and then move to a, a, little, bit, a little bit bigger topic about the role of, role of natural gas in uh, China's overall energy structure and the contribution to, uh, to the low-carbon thing that we're going to hear more from, uh, from our main speaker um, today. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the topics, we, there are kind of a three types of um, uh, unconventional gas, uh, mainly, uh, not uh, exclusively. Uh, there is uh, something called tight gas, and there is something called the coban methane, CBM, and is, there is a, a shale gas. Uh, in case of China, uh, tight gas has been produced for about 10 years already. They are part of the, the natural gas numbers, natural gas data you've been seeing um, uh, all the time. So they are already been there, about 20% of the production. Uh, usually people, um, um, I'm, go I'm gonna skip that, I'm focusing on uh, CBM and the shale gas with, uh, potential in, in China. Uh, I, I do have to separate them because uh, they are at the different stages of uh, developments. Uh, first about the CBM, uh, the resources potential is uh, very, very large, 
and even bigger than the U.S., you know, if you uh, believe in the, the numbers. We're talking about 13,000, 1,300 TCF, trillion cubic feet of uh, resources of the CBM in China. But uh, I just want to say that when you're down to the so-called proven reserves of the CBM in the country, it's only 2.2. .2. So the, the, the difference of the, um, the, the size of the, res the difference between the resources and the proven reserves are very big, indicating that China has a long way to go to um, uh, developing the, the resources. I'm going to skip the details about where the resources are located uh, in case there are questions. Uh, in terms of uh, shale gas, uh, very similar, and there are different estimates of uh, shale gas uh, resources in China. There is no proven reserves. The proven reserves is zero so far because they just started the exploration uh, in shale gas. Then the resource is also in a range of somewhere like 1,000 TCF to something like uh, uh, 1,600 TCF in China. So again, huge numbers, but uh, the work has not started yet. So in terms of that, now I, I, uh, let's move to the production side. And here the huge difference between the CBM, cobalt methane, uh, versus uh, shale gas in China. The cobalt methane China has about a little over 15 years of development experiences already. They started in 1995 when China looked at the U.S. and U.S. had a huge coal industry, had a huge uh, cobalt methane production, which at that time was bigger than China's entire conventional natural gas production. So they looked to, China, to the U.S. and to other countries like Australia for the potential, uh, for the possibility of uh, uh, developing China's CBM industry. But the results are very disappointing for the past 15 years. And there are many reasons which I probably will not go over all the reasons if, uh, unless I have some time. And so right now, uh, very simple, that China produced a meager amount of CBM. Uh, the volume is we call it about 7 billion cubic meters, 7 BCM. And out of that 7 BCM, um, it's, it's, uh, it's only a, um, a 1 BCM is, is actually produced from commercial wells. Even though China drilled about 4,000 wells already in, in a surf, um, surface drilling. And another, another 6 BCM uh, billion cubic meter is actually from, uh, from the uh, extraction uh, of the coal mines, coal mines extraction, which is pretty much flared. It's not really much uh, utilized. And production of shale gas, zero right now. So just the status of that. Then after, uh, now I move back to CBM again. Um, in terms of consumption and the distribution, um, because of the 15 years of the development, they have done a lot of work in this area, but still were very much underdeveloped. And out of the whatever the production in China is merely about 30% is being consumed. Another 70%, 70% really kind of flared, and mainly because they're produced by coal mines. And the first job of the coal mines is really extract copper methane and release it so they can uh, make it a little safer. And so they need to improve not only the overall production level, but also the ratio of the consumption. Distribution of CBM is a big issue in China. This is one of the obstacles why in the past 15 years it didn't do very well. Because CBM, the cost of developing the pipelines for CBM is very, very expensive. And it's a chicken and egg problem that you need a bigger CBM production to be able to justify the long distance pipeline to, uh, uh, to distant cities. Uh, uh, then you need the pipeline infrastructure to justify upstream investment. So they go on and on uh, like that. And in the meantime, China's overall infrastructure, particularly 15 years ago, of the natural gas infrastructure is very much lacking, which is another obstacle. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, for uh, even though today uh, China's length of the natural gas pipelines perhaps is about um, about 20 percent and less of the U.S. Uh, 10 to 20 percent, even that is kind of built 80 percent of that. Uh, infrastructure we've seen today, which is much bigger than before. 80% was built after 1995. So you can imagine, you know, 15 years ago, when China started CBM, the infrastructure was very much kind of in shortage. And that is reason why, that was the reason why, so you, you, you cannot develop your own long-distance pipelines 
you cannot connect to the existing ones because it was non-existent. Of course, things have changed. That's why the next 15 years may be different. In terms of the uh, uh, shale gas distribution, it doesn't exist, just like production. So um, there is a little bit about CBM economics in China. Um, the, th this has something to do with overall natural gas pricing regime uh, in the country. Again, this is uh, one of the impediments why CBM was not very well developed, because Chinese natural gas price uh, regime is very much regulated, fragmented, and very much kind of depressed in, in, in many sense. Uh, although there is a dilemma, you know, if you set the prices too high, consumer cannot pay. But overall, you know, uh, natural gas pricing was regulated and depressed, and that also hindered the uh, development of CBM for the, uh, um, for the past 15 years. And, but that has improved quite a bit in the past several years, and China continued to reform the natural gas regime, and that certainly in many ways helping uh, the, the unconventional gas, both copper methane and shale gas. And our numbers suggest that the current CBM economics are right in the edge of the natural gas price regime. So they are, they are uh, kind of uh, uh, encouraging um, if you also consider the government support, which I'm going to uh, cover a little bit uh, later. And shale gas economics is, uh, is very hard, very difficult to um, gauge at this moment. However, if you use CBM as a uh, guidance, there is a chance that uh, the shale gas may also can become economical if the other issues being solved. Uh, now the players, uh, the, main, the main players are a little bit kind of, again, different among these two types of um, gases. Um, in the uh, um, uh, CBM, uh, you have a long history of development and uh, without going too much to the details, Today, you have uh, the major players in the uh, CBM industry in China is uh, PetroChina, and you have uh, uh, China United Copper Methane Corporation, uh, COCBM, and you have the coal mines, individual large coal mines, and then you have uh, a bunch of, like a dozen, uh, uh, more than a dozen uh, foreign companies. They have contracts with uh, both PetroChina and COCBM uh, at, at present, so we have you know, a number of companies that, in case you are like Green Dragon Energy, Far East Energy from here, and you have Fortune Oil in, in Hong Kong, uh, Asian American company. There is a long list of the companies and that they, they share the contract with both um, PetroChina and, and COCBM. The, uh, the provinces that this contract involved, mainly in the North China, Shanxi province, and also neighboring Shanxi province, but also in Southwest provinces like Guizhou and uh, Yunnan provinces and, and in the eastern part of China like Jiangsu province. So they, there's all over the place, but you can see that it's pretty much where the uh, coal resources um, uh, concentrate. Uh, shale gas, uh, the players are a little bit different. Shale gas has nothing to do with coal at least. So the major players are the main state oil companies in China. So you have uh, CNPC PetroChina again, uh, you have a Sanopec, now you have Sinac and CNOC, which is an interesting player. Uh, part of the reason CNOC has become important today and is not only because of the, um, uh, the Chesapeake sort of uh, investment uh, uh, they, they made just uh, two weeks ago, um, but also because uh, after, you know, um, one of the major players, uh, the China, Cobain, <coughs> China United Cobain Methane Corporation, after Petro China left them three years ago, two years ago, three years ago, and they kind of in, 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 uh, disorganized. And they badly need the, uh, the new kind of blood, new input from other. And CNARC expressed interest in joining COCBM. So you can see that suddenly CNARC as offshore company now is uh, jumping in, in, uh, in a field, become a, a player. And then you had a foreign companies. So they, uh, because shale gas started only last year, so unlike CB, uh, CBM, you have uh, over a dozen small companies, but also like Shell and, and uh, Chevron uh, among them for the CB, uh, CBM. But in shale gas, it's more currently, it's mainly the, the major foreign companies and uh, some, some uh, Australian companies like Shell, BP, and Chevron, and, and also Arrow Energy, which is now bought by uh, CMPC and uh, Shell. 
and, and, and also um, the spin-off of aero energy, dark energy and in, in, in the area. So you have a selective, you have a few uh, foreign companies. It had a cleaner start because everything uh, is no history for this, uh, um, and, uh, for, for this uh, development. Uh, of course, PetroChina is already in Canada looking for um, this kind of experiences of uh, shale gas and CNARC, I already mentioned, and the CMPC also, uh, as mentioned, in Australia. Uh, in terms of the p policy support, the government uh, today have uh, pretty much uh, uh, systemized the, the policy support for CBM. Although the CBM players still believe that is not enough, um, I, I, there's a few things. Uh, the most important one is like value added tax. It's kind of, uh, there is a um, uh, reimbursement, accelerated uh, depreciation, there is um, a direct subsidies of the price, and resource tax exemption and income tax exemption and, and reduction. And shale gas, uh, that's applied for CBM so far. And shale gas pretty much have a similar, um, uh, although it's not quite final yet, but, but expected to have a similar, enjoy a similar, a similar kind of uh, uh, policy benefits. So uh, the last thing about this one is the future growth. Where China will, will, will go? And I know that the, the units can be a um, 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 uh, problem that, uh, I, I mentioned 7 BCM uh, uh, of the uh, production of uh, uh, COCBM. Uh, there are different numbers um, uh, reported by China, even planned by the authority. Some of them very, very sort of uh, ambitious. For instance, you know, one, of, uh, one, of, uh, one of the targets in the medium long-term program in China, energy development, saying that by 2020, they were gonna produce a 50 BCM, 50 BCM of copper methane only. So think about it, China's uh, gas production is only 83 something uh, BCM uh, last year. So 50 is, is a huge number, and I, I think it's really ambitious. But PetroChina and uh, Central Pack now has a more realistic target. Uh, CMPC has a target about uh, 10 BCM by 2020, only for CBM. And Central Pack has a, um, a kind of a 2.5 BCM of, um, uh, of uh, unconventional gas combining CBM and shale gas together. The, uh, um, and then you have all kinds of other sort of uh, reports about the targets. And basically, what, what, what I'm looking at is uh, my base case kind of projection uh, following the, um, uh, their production plans of the individual players. I'm, I'm just gonna give you a reference number because I'm gonna use this number a little bit later um, in, in a minute. That I'm looking at CBM roughly about 20 BCM by 2020 and the uh, uh, shale gas is about 80 BCM, eight, under 10, so eight BCM by 2020. So we're looking at 29 BCM by 2020. I have a high case and low case. I'm not gonna show the numbers here. Um, so what is the share of this, uh, what does this mean? What is this 20 whatever um, BCM means? Uh, the ballpark number is by 2020, uh, um, I'm looking at uh, combining CBM and shale gas as unconventional gas. It's about 15.15% of China's total domestic gas production. Combining unconventional and conventional together is about 15%. In terms of production, it's about a little under 10%. It's about 9%. That's how I look at it in, in a base case, but there is a uh, high case um, uh, as well. So now I, I, um, I, I, I hope I have a few more minutes, and uh, I, I move to bigger issues, because unconventional gas is gas, right? It's not like um, 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 that it's, it's, they're totally separate products. So why natural gas? Uh, there is a, you know, issues we already heard earlier that China you know, has a high economic Growth and high energy um, depend, uh, high energy consumption, and had very the highest I would say among the major economies. China has highest dependence on coal, and the, uh, in comparison, the share of natural gas is uh, amazingly very low. is only three point four percent in a total primary energy uh, consumption. So, what is a, a benefit? So, for every one percent of the increase of natural gas replacing coal, the savings of the coal will be 50, uh, five zero, 50 million tons of coal savings in today's standard. And by 2020, there'll be almost 100 million, coal, 100 million tons of coal uh, savings, uh, uh, less of coal consumption for 1% uh, 
of the, um, um, the natural gas in, uh, percentage increase. Uh, the government has a very ambitious program. Uh, the, you know, from, from they, they are going to raise the share of natural gas from uh, um, uh, 4% to 10 percent by 20, uh, actually they are, they are even, uh, by 2020, some mentioned 2015, which is kind of unbelievable, but um, I'm looking at the double the share from like roughly 3.5 percent to about 7 percent. Let's say 4 percentage, 4 percentage increase by 2020 for China's natural gas uh, uh, consumption, that will, will replace um, by 2020 400 million tons of coal uh, consumption. And so that, that's kind of huge uh, sort of a be benefit of, of, of doing that. And continuously, um, why natural gas um, uh, for China? And that not only because of the coal is over, uh, over dependence on coal and the less uh, de uh, development of gas. And China also has a huge uh, gas potential. And we just mentioned both uh, uh, conventional and unconventional. So that, that, is a, um, that is a kind of benefit of, of doing that. And China's imports of natural gas is still very s low, although China has become the first Asian country to import both LNG and the pipeline gas, only the first country, even though the volume is very small. But you know, Thailand import pipeline gas, but not LNG. Singapore import pipeline gas, but not LNG. Japan is a big LNG importer, but no pipeline gas. So China is both from Turkmenistan and from, from LNG. And energy security implications for using more gas is also there because oil is the issue. And lastly, and uh, uh, that is, is, is a cleaner and more efficient, uh, efficient fuel, but it's not carbon free. Um, so what is the commonality or the common characteristic of natural gas? I, I think you, you um, for those of you, uh, uh, you know already, uh, carbon is not a big, big sort of uh, benefit but it's the benefit. It's about roughly 50% less than oil, uh, less than coal, and about 30% less than oil. But again, you know, the range it can be very big. Um, but if you're coming down to the NOx issue, the nitrogen, you talk about sulfur issue, other than the sour gas in the Middle East, but China is a sweet gas, so it's a different story. So uh, sulfur um, is, the benefit is a huge, like 80, 90% uh, lower, particulates, and mercury and other impurities, of course, is really, really a lot of benefits there. And that, that's a, the, the, the reason that you want to. Uh, so what are the challenges for natural gas? Uh, again, I don't want to uh, talk too much about, about this. Number one is uh, politically, natural gas is still fossil fuel. So many people don't necessarily distinguish between, uh, they don't want to distinguish oil, gas, natural gas from oil. They're all petroleum. So if they petroleum, they have uh, they have a trouble. They have fossil energy, so they have a trouble future. And uh, in China, particularly, there is a market fragmented f fragmentation problem. Natural gas in uh, market in China is uh, small regionally, and is uh, is fragmented. So the economy of scale is 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 an issue. And infrastructure is still lacking, and improved a lot is still lacking. Pricing issues is still a long way to go. How China can link the price? natural gas with other fossil fuels, particular oil, and, and how, to link, how to link, and what about coal? And th those kind of issues are still kind of a, 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 a problem, facing a challenges facing, facing the country. And competition from coal and also the occasionally from oil, that's the other way to look at this. They do have competition from coal strongly, and also like LPG and, uh, and, and, and other issue, uh, other oil products. And, and if, you, uh, if you want to import more LNG, then rising international gas prices is a challenge. But in the meantime, it's a challenge for the imports, but also the uh, uh, benefits for the unconventional gas, which is the higher price means you, know, you have a better alternative than uh, to, uh, to the LNG imports. So um, I want to come down to the, uh, the final numbers again, you know, what, what that unconventional uh, sector supposed to mean again. So come back to unconventional gas issue in China again. Um, I, I'm not look, looking at a 2050, you know, that long term, only, only uh, 2020, uh, that I already mentioned that uh, in terms of the production, it's about 15% of the total gas production by 2020, and under 10% of consumption by 2020. Um, but in terms of the unconventional gas only, um, based on the, uh, my base case scenario, that uh, 
um, by 2020, with the amount of unconventional gas that uh, uh, produce and uh, utilize in China, they could save around 50, 5 zero, 50 million tons of coal by 2020. So it's still kind of meager. So we have to, we have to uh, be realistic and put into that perspective. But as many um, uh, of you realize and other people um, kind of um, uh, predict, if there is a, similar to the US, if there is a no restriction and everything fully, the full potential realized, the upper end, the upper uh, uh, limit of the unconventional is really unlimited. So the sky is the limit. And, and also t timing is the issue. Beyond 2020, uh, 2030, then the, uh, the, the amount of uh, um, unconventional gas will become much bigger and when the economics um, uh, is, is right. Um, well, I, um, I, that's pretty much what I, I want to say, and uh, there are some international, issue, international uh, cooperation issues as well. Then when President Obama visited um, China, they signed this uh, um, uh, shale gas cooperation agreement with Chinese, and there's a lot of uh, things going on between China and the U.S. Uh, on this, um, in this uh, area. So that, that you know, is, is another uh, perspective of this uh, uh, unconventional gas. Uh, still, you know, China has a lot to learn from the, from the U.S. and uh, still have, uh, have to um, adopt the right technologies for, um, for the unconventional gas uh, development. I know my uh, presentation is very short and uh, I'm looking forward to questions and uh, to give more uh, sort of uh, clarifications. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll go since uh, his uh, presentation, Nate, I think you, is your presentation that's, that's up there? Okay, well, I think why don't we switch then to uh, the, the renewables uh, uh, question. There's been a, a lot of debate um, and a lot of information that's gone around uh, this town for sure on renewable energy in China. So we hope that uh, Nate Bullard from uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, I still have stumbled over that whole name. But that's all right. So do you probably. I do, I, do. Yeah, I still do uh, occasionally as well. Uh, can help us uh, get some perspective on the investment in renewable energy um, uh, for the, the future. Thank you. Uh, everybody hear me all right? Yes, I, this presentation, you've been tantalized by seeing about half of it for the last 20 minutes. Uh, I'm with Bloomberg New Energy Finance, which is a <clears throat> sort of an independent house within Bloomberg LP that covers clean energy in the carbon markets. My specialty is solar energy in the United States, but as an aspect of that, I deal with all of the sort of trade-weighted implications that come with, well, supply and demand, who, uh, and not only supply and demand in terms of global numbers, but where those numbers are coming from. My colleagues and I wrote a white paper last year, and sorry, earlier this year, rather, on what we called joined at the hip, the U.S.-China clean energy relationship. And it proved to be quite timely. We were writing this uh, during the early days of this debate when it was about a sort of hypothetical Texas wind farm. Uh, the, I'll get into that actually towards the end, but that, that debate has actually expanded quite a bit. And so I'm sort of walk through the, the, the data behind this discussion of trade. And I'm going to look at China's low carbon pathway almost purely from an export perspective here, though with a little bit of, of uh, domestic aspect as well. The implications for trade and some numbers that I think have been neglected in the political debate around not just trade items, but actual energy generation and long-term assets. It's something that is a little bit subtle, I think, for a lot of the political debates that are engaging this, uh, this dialogue between the U.S. and China. So Kate showed you some numbers like this already. Uh, these are just the power production growth numbers. And uh, apologies, that's meant to be terawatt hours and not gigawatt hours. Uh, I can assure you there's a little bit more power than that going on in China. <laughs> the, the most important thing to note within this is the compounded annual growth rates if you're to compare these two countries. 5% China, about 1% of the United States. And also, as mentioned, there's higher growth rates for every resource besides coal, but coal is still the, the bottom end and absolutely the backbone of power generation. And even within this, China's becoming a very large electrical system, so a huge growth in renewable energy does not necessarily make it an extremely large part of the overall, the overall mix. But what's interesting to watch is what that means in terms of uh, investment, internal investment flow in asset finance. There's a lot of ways to look at the numbers in renewable energy. You can look at 
numbers that happen in the public markets. You can look at venture capital and private equity. You can look at asset finance. Asset finance is building stuff. So asset finance is what's actually putting plants in the ground. Last year, we did just shy of $100 billion in asset finance globally in clean energy. United States has been always a leader, Europe ahead of the United States even. But in the last couple of years, China has actually overtaken the United States in terms of asset investment. So hard dollars going into the ground to create fixed assets. China is de deploying materially more capital to that end. And with an added wrinkle that given the generally lower costs per megawatt for any of this installed equipment done in China, you're getting proportionally more investment for that dollar, that dollar put in the ground. That's not to say that China has quite yet overtaken the United States. I mean, you're, you're having games that play in parallel. We could well see this trend sort of continue, where you've got United States at a sort of fixed delta above China. Though, honestly, I doubt it. I think that you'll see more asset investment in China, especially if you include all of the sort of supporting investment that you need in terms of grid development. The other aspect is equipment manufacture. If you want to get into where China really leads right now in an external facing aspect, it's in the manufacture of equipment. Quick show of hands if anybody knows where Yingli Solar is based, or for that matter has even heard of it. On the table we'll get some people who know it probably. I see two hands, okay. Solar Fun, JA. Canadian Solar, despite the name, is completely a Chinese company. Uh, they moved their corporate headquarters, but these are, these, are, these are companies that have, have rapidly, and I think for those not, not watching this quite as closely as I watch, very healthily entered the global market for clean energy equipment. And in fact, if you're looking for the largest producers of cells, so the fundamental, the fundamental element of creating a, a solar panel and then creating solar power, China is in the lead. In the top 10 manufacturers, in fact, you have only one that is US. On wind, it's a slightly different story. The largest uh, company is in Denmark. The second largest is GE. And while you see four out of the top 15 turbine manufacturers are Chinese, at the moment, none of them are actually strong exporters. Solar technology in China is, is a completely well-developed at the moment as an export industry, but interestingly is not much of a domestic project industry yet. China is proceeding uh, at a very measured pace uh, and a very cost-focused, uh, in a very cost-focused manner on deploying solar power in China. Wind, on the other hand, is I think probably equipment-wise and in terms of the ability to raise debt, not quite as robust as the, as the, side, the solar side is, but as a much larger industry within China. China did about 40 percent more wind investment last year than the United States did, using almost entirely its own equipment. If you want to talk exports, this is those companies that I mentioned, Yingli, Trina Solar, Solar Fund. And the market share that they've been able to capture in the U.S.'s largest solar market, which is California. This market, two, let's say now three years ago, was almost completely supplied by the United States and by Japan. And in the past several years, you see this progression wherein China takes increasingly more and more market share out of a very cost-focused, and I should say quality focused and finance oriented market. So you start to see these proportions in the market, 40%, more than 40% market share in any given quarter coming from China. Those are hard numbers in the sense that that's actual equipment that will be financed and go into the ground using US lending standards and using uh, the scrutiny of a lot of US equity investors. Important to know. I want to get into sort of the enabling aspects that allow this investment to take place. This is the dollar yuan conversion. This looks like pretty much a uniform function from 2005 to 2010. If you wanted to just draw a graph of what a managed currency looks like, it's this. Just as a quick comparison, that's the US dollar to the euro over the same time period. Currency really helps. Stable currency providing a visibility to, to those who are going to be exporting, very valuable. This is another aspect. If the United States has a great deal of energy uh, applied to stimulus funding for its industries, 
and to using the tax code to incentivize investment in renewable energy through investment tax credits and through manufacturing tax credits. I think China has taken a more direct approach through lending towards supporting industries. This is since April. That's $33 billion in lending from China Development Bank alone to six of the largest clean energy manufacturers in the country. $33 billion is also, just as an interesting comparison, almost the entirety of the money that the Department of Energy has devoted to it in the next several years to get out the door in stimulus funding. These are large numbers. I mean, these are, these are numbers that, that in many cases exceed the revenue uh, over several years' worth of time for some of these companies. And they're being provided not only for sort of expansion funding to build new plants or to make an acquisition or something like that. This is money that's also available to help shore up the balance sheet as an export-oriented measure. This provides some sort of safe harbor for investors who are interested in buying, these, in buying this equipment. It provides a deep, deep line of credit if you're going to be making an asset investment overseas. This is a very direct instrument to help these companies compete internationally. It's also interesting to note that these are companies that were already all leading. None of these companies were laggards by any means. These are all the best-in-class manufacturers in solar and the, one of the best-in-class manufacturers in wind. And I think this is the fun part, actually, is the, in the, the U.S. and China trade debate, we hear a lot of discussion about equipment flowing from one place to another. So, you know, we're being, oh, the United States is being filled up with Chinese clean energy equipment. You've seen, David, how many political ads with, <laughs> with wind turbines in them this year? Three or four? M more than you would expect, especially for a market that doesn't really exist yet. I've seen, we, 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 we checked and I think I saw four ads on YouTube where, where a political candidate is saying something about sending jobs to China and use the wind turbine as an example. There's not much of a Chinese wind market yet in the United States, I keep reiterating, but there is a solar market. And one of the things that we, that we did in our analysis was to look into the value chain, because Kate already indicated that there's, there's a value chain in place for anything. You build a nuclear plant in China, it has equipment from somewhere else in it. It has expertise from somewhere else in it. You build a solar module in China, it also has equipment from somewhere else in it. So, as a, as, a, as a thought exercise, we took actual, using our knowledge of what happens in actual components in the value chain, a module made by SunTech. This is a leading company in Jiangsu province. There's about 20% of the overall value added in the equipment, and that actually comes from the United States. You've got silicon that is the highest margin part of the value chain and the most specialized coming from the U.S. and going to China going into a PV module that tends to then come right back across to the United States. But as an interesting comparison, we took as well a, a piece of U.S. equipment. This is a module that's made by SunPower, and this data is disclosed through their public filings. This is part of their, part of their regulatory filings with the SEC. This is an American piece of equipment, but the polysilicon comes from Korea. The middle phases, wherein they turn, it into a, a, turn that polysilicon into a wafer and then turn that wafer into a cell so that the fundamental generation unit takes place in Philippines. And then the assembly part can take place almost anywhere. In fact, many of the leading companies do not actually own an assembly plant. It's done on a contract basis. In this case, uh, it can be done in the United States. It can also be done in Mexico or Poland or China. But what you see is that the, the difference, and this is if you were to use sun, a sun power module that is actually being built and put together in the United States, is that the proportions of value added are not all of that different. This is an international good, where, regardless of where it comes from. We did the same comparison on wind. For a long time, there was a strong market for uh, U.S. and international turbine providers building factories and selling goods in China for the Chinese wind market. That is less so the case these days. The, as, as you indicated from my earlier slide, there are plenty of people in China providing turbines themselves. But we wanted to look on an installed basis. Let's say that you took a turbine. Uh, you, well, actually, sorry, i get to the installed basis in a moment. Let's just take a turbine and put that turbine together, again, by the same value chain. China, international in this case, is anything ex-China, but it could be the United States. 
tends to be Europe. Build this up and you find that a Chinese turbine installed in China is about 60% Chinese, 8% US, 35% though international. Lump that towards the US and you're talking about something that is more than 40% built in the United States for a Chinese, a Chinese installation. And let's say that you were to take a Sinovel turbine so one of the, from one of the largest Chinese companies and do the same in the United States. That's if you're installing the turbine on the ground in, say, West Texas, where this political debate always seems to center. One of the things that rarely actually is going to travel overseas is the tower and the foundation for, wind, for, for a wind turbine. That's probably because they're about six meters wide and nobody wants to send them anywhere. Blades do travel sometimes from China, but most of the time do not. They're very, very large. What people tend to do is ship the mold for the blade because that costs the same as shipping two blades. <laughs> Ship the mold and make your blades there. <coughs> the highest value added aspects in this, in this turbine are still going to be US. That's the control system and the power converter. And what you end up with is in this, this, uh, <clears throat> this Chinese turbine installed in the US is that it's still about 40% US. So that's, that's one half of it. That's just the installation, but what, what we think is often missing in the debate is the difference between this as effectively a product, a turbine or a solar panel as something that you build and then buy versus an actual energy production project. I mean, in many ways, building a, building a solar panel is like building a television. But the television doesn't continue as a productive asset for 25 or even 30 years. And a wind farm is a power project. It's not an investment scheme, it's not, a, it's not a work program. It is a fundamental unit for generating electricity over 20 years. So let's take that wind turbine and turn it not just into an installed asset as I had before, or an installed thing, let's say, a product, and let's make it into an actual project that's generating power. Over the lifetime of a project, a value creation over, let's say, two decades of power purchase agreement between the project and a utility, where does all of the value go? And what's very interesting to see is this is to take the, take the turbine that is incorporating the most possible equipment coming from China proper and installing it in the United States. A great deal of the value, $301,000 per megawatt over the lifetime comes from construction. Another almost 200 comes from financing, if you use US financing for only 25%. There is, no, there is no requirement anywhere that you could not do this 100% US financed. We just expect that if you were to do this project now, it would probably be about 75% debt financed by a, a Chinese entity. Then you've got another one there, O&M. If you wanted to say O&M in a different fashion, that's jobs. That's <clears throat> probably going to be US. We, we don't really have any expectation that in once, once a turbine is installed, there is a non-local work crew maintaining it. That rarely, that rarely happens anywhere. There are instances in which you need some extremely high-placed expertise specific to a piece of equipment, but it's unlikely to happen in the wind turbine value chain. So that's US, effectively. Put it all together, and far and away the largest portion of this project by value creation is US. So part of this, I guess what's, what's, what we feel is very important to include in the debate on, on clean energy, on, on who, who helps whom, is to see where the long-term value, not just in terms of the trade balance and dollars flowing in one direction uh, and product flowing in another direction in a given year is, but what's the dynamic in terms of creating an energy economy? And that's a little bit more subtle and I guess a little bit more complicated. And I think actually, that's it, except for one more thing. <laughs> I forgot I had this one. Uh, there's, 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 one, there's one last wrinkle, which is for all that talk on investment. I mentioned in the total numbers on clean energy, there's lots of ways to talk about it. And one of the most popular ways here is to talk about venture capital and private equity. This is uh, an instrument of financing, a vector of getting capital into play and for creating companies that the United States really excels at. And in that sense, this is still a United States game and is likely to always remain one. 
if China might have taken the lead in terms of asset investment, it had only a very brief lead years ago in venture capital and private equity investment in clean energy, and the United States has managed to get back on top and stay on top. What you see there in 2006 is actually the money that came in to those solar companies that I mentioned before, which was the last phase of capital before those companies then became public. All of the money that came before was being provided by local and provincial governments uh, and by some local financial institutions. It's now not really there anymore. It's not really needed. These companies are large enough to get a $9 billion loan from the China Development Bank. Seeking venture capital and private equity is not really necessary. But what these figures, the United States figures, 2008, 2009, 2010 represent is companies that are going to be founded in the United States uh, and in many cases are providing part of that value chain that goes back and forth to China in the interaction between, between the two countries, not just in the one-way trade flow. And I think now that is actually my last slide. So thank you very much. If you guys are interested in the white paper, we actually have it published on our website. It's available for download, and it gets into these, these issues sort of in greater detail. And uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Um, thanks, Nate. Um, the, our next speaker um, is not on your, your program because we were actually uncertain uh, that uh, he would uh, be able to be with us uh, today. Um, we didn't really want to do a uh, discussion of secure low carbon pathways without talking about energy efficiency because it's such a, a central part of the uh, Chinese policy and approach. Um, we had uh, uh, tried to contact a couple of people who have been working very closely, um, but unfortunately they have now taken on a new endeavor with the Department of Energy and had to cancel their participation uh, at the last minute. So got in touch with John Milhone, an old friend from uh, the Department of Energy who is now at Carnegie, and asked him if he'd be willing to step in. And after some uh, soul searching, he decided he would come and join us. Um, John, we'll have to get your uh, presentation up. John um, has a long history in energy efficiency worldwide, and I think is going to present something based on the work of Mark Levine um, at the uh, uh, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Lisa's coming. What's that? Lisa's coming. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, David. It's uh, good to be here, and I uh, am pleased to be able to talk about energy efficiency in an area where energy efficiency is so critical to. Uh, not only the uh, events in China as far as their economic viability, but also their climate characteristics, but also uh, to the U.S. and globally. Um, because I'm uh, scrambling to be able to say something that's helpful in this topic, I have used some resources uh, very elaborately uh, including the good work that uh, Mark Levine and his uh, Climate Energy Group uh, have uh, performed at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. I've uh, plagiarized a good deal of material from uh, what uh, Mark uh, provided. Uh, he and uh, Bill Chandler, who's uh, a colleague at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, were speakers at a, a major uh, evening program at the Asilomar program, Asilomar summer study uh, sponsored by the ACEEE. And I think it sort of represented the priority that China is getting uh, in the United States and internationally by the fact that uh, one evening was devoted to uh, the description of what was happening in China. In my comments, uh, I will try to be efficient myself. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit about the history, what's good times and bad that's happened in China, then talk about energy efficiency, particularly uh, the sources and, and uses, a summary, and then a look at the future. Um, the uh, history of energy efficiency and climate change in China uh, has, has had good days and, and bad. Um, from uh, 
1980 to 2002, there was a significant uh, priority that was given to China by the national government for energy efficiency, and you saw quite a, a rapid uh, improvement in the energy intensity in China. Uh, then in uh, 2002 to 2005, uh, there was a change. In part, uh, there had been some lack of maintenance in terms of the energy efficiency programs and activities, and that showed up. Uh, there was a, a major increase in economic activity, um, and um, because of this activity, the products that China sold, which were energy intensive in the manufacture, uh, had a very fast growing international application so that the energy intensity increased about 5%, whereas prior to this period, it had been, uh, it, the intensity had been increasing and it decreased here. Uh, then as a result of uh, recognition that there needed to be change in the 11th uh, five-year plan, major activities were taken to uh, improve the energy intensity in China and very significant activities were made, uh, including a, uh, an effort to uh, mandate a 20% energy intensity gain uh, in, t in, the fifth, in the 11th five-year plan and uh, then support from the Premier and the National People's Congress. Multiple actions were taken at the federal and at the regional and at the local level. Uh, this is, uh, shows uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, greenhouse, the CO2 emissions that were anticipated uh, prior to that rapid growth. Uh, that shows the uh, actual implication, actual growth in CO2 emissions and how the uh, China CO2 emissions then uh, passed those of the U.S. Uh, as a result of that period when the exports and uh, carbon intensity uh, caused uh, this kind of surprising uh, but significant change. Now, uh, this shows the implications of those good time and bad times. Uh, the, the good times when the energy intensity uh, decreased, then the period when it increased at 5%, and then the result of the 11th five-year plan and the energy efficiency measures that uh, have, <coughs> have been have been undertaken as a result of that five-year plan. Uh, one thing this shows is the significance of the national policy in China and the priorities that are set and the way that those priorities are implemented through a variety of different activities. And that's something that as we look ahead, uh, we also need to recognize. In my comments, I'm going to talk about the components of the uh, low carbon and energy efficiency activities in Russia. Uh, primarily the, uh, uh, and when we're talking about energy efficiency, it's important to look at energy efficiency uh, from the energy sources as well as the end uses. Because if you save energy uh, in the building sector or industrial sector, that means that you lose, need to use less energy uh, be it electricity or heat or primary energy fuel. So that uh, if you look uh, at the energy and uses uh, in China, the industrial sector oftentimes is described as 70 percent. Uh, if you, that, that includes some industrial parks where housing, hospitals, and commercial buildings are part of the, regarded as part of the industrial sector. If you look at what we would describe more commonly as industrial processes, that's more closer to 61%. If you look at the end use energy as a share of all the energy that's used, uh, if you look at it in this way, it's about 25%. And transportation is about 14%, but it's growing very rapidly. One of the things that uh, I mentioned that difference because oftentimes when we think of energy and energy efficiency, we look only at the end uses. Uh, this is something that shows the importance of looking at 
the end use uh, energy efficiency as it compares with some of the energy supply courses. So we've all heard a great deal about the Three Gorges plan and the huge energy production that's come about as, that, as a result of that. In this case, I'm comparing uh, that production from the energy savings calculated 10 years after the standard tests were made uh, for uh, 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 a sta appliance standards implemented for air conditioners and refrigerators. So you can see that uh, it's important not only in terms, of, uh, in terms of the quantitative value of what you're getting from the energy efficiency measures. Uh, we're looking at uh, electricity. Here I'm going to show some examples of what uh, good accomplishments that have been made in some areas where uh, there are still uh, challenges that need to be addressed. Um, one of the significant things in the electricity area has been an increase in the amount of, uh, in the rates that are paid for electricity. For example, uh, energy prices were increased from the equivalent of 4.2 cents per kilowatt hour in 1924, uh, then two years later up to 6.4 cents per kilowatt hour, and these changes have continued. Uh, at the same time, uh, the electricity prices uh, uh, are regulated, coal prices are not regulated, so that when the coal prices have gone up, there's been an increase in the subsidy that's been required to make up that balance. And uh, because of that, the, the users of electricity have not seen the real price of electricity and moving more forward to cost-based energy rates, which is the trend but hasn't been achieved yet, will be a significant way to encourage the energy efficiency measures that would save that cost-based electricity. In addition, in the electricity area, importantly, small, inefficient coal-based electricity plants have been closed and appointments have been made in, in coal-fired uh, electricity boilers. Uh, this, uh, let's see, I need to go back. Uh, this is... Uh, <coughs> I'm going to go back to uh, uh, what I've done here is copied some slides from Mark Levine's presentation, and those are annual years uh, in the, across the bottom. It doesn't show on the slide, but I apologize for that. What's that? To 2010. Okay, I'm going to go back. Okay, I'm, before I leave buildings, there's been uh, the small industrial plants have been closed down. Uh, the goal of the top 10 in energy consuming <coughs> enterprises, which make up 50% of the industrial sector, uh, those have been uh, significant improvements, uh, reductions in the energy intensity there. Uh, there's been uh, uh, tax rate rebates for exporters have been, have been lowered. Uh, for the energy intensive uh, products. So there have been a number of factors uh, there as well. Move on to the uh, building sector. Building codes have been initiated. Uh, 
and uh, have been expanded uh, countrywide, uh, and they've been uh, in strength, but slowly in strength there. The, 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 uh, there has been limited progress in the retrofit of uh, existing buildings. Uh, one of the success areas is mandatory appliance standards uh, introduced in 1990. Now they've been expanded to uh, 23 products, including most uh, residential and commercial appliances. One of the important areas is government procurement. Government has mandated the procurement of more energy efficient products. That has been extend extended and that has made a significant purchasing power for more energy efficient products. Uh, this shows uh, one of the uh, differences in the performance in some of the buildings area. Uh, the uh, uh, heat supply reform in buildings, which is shown on the right, uh, has made significant improvements. Uh, one of the areas where little progress has been made is in the improvement in the retrofit of existing buildings so that the uh, indication on the left, that column shows the, the lack of significant progress uh, based upon the goals that had been set in the retrofit of existing buildings. In the area of, could I have a little water? In the area of transportation, uh, there's been progress through the mandatory fuel standards for vehicles. Uh, 16 different weight classes uh, for, uh, for uh, built, and these have been significantly increased, although, uh, uh, and uh, ranked favorably compared with some of the U.S. standards, for example. Um, in the emission standards, China has followed the European standards on emissions, uh, and there have been uh, taxes on vehicles, and those have been higher for larger energy-intensive vehicles. On summary then, uh, the aggressive top-down priority that China has given to energy efficiency has achieved unparalleled results. Uh, the challenge now is to build up an implementation capacity so that the goals and policies that have been set uh, are more effectively implemented to strengthen the compliance uh, with the programs and to prioritize and integrate these various results. Uh, the uh, issue now is what's a way ahead. The reports being received from China's uh, 12th five-year plan, which is just getting, excuse me, which is just, <clears throat> that didn't help much, which is, <laughs> which is just uh, getting, um, uh, announced recently, and we will be hearing more and more about the effects of that as we go forward. But the signs uh, from what we've seen so far are encouraging. That if uh, the tough targets that have been set in the 11th five-year plan appear to be continued into the 12th five-year year plan, uh, and uh, to be included in terms of energy efficiency and carbon change. The plan is expected to see uh, a, a 15 to 20 percent reduction in energy intensity uh, to will continue the guidance that have been taken in the 11th five-year plan. Uh, a spending program of a significant amount, 754 billion for alternative energy the next 10 years is one of the expectations. This information is from uh, Climate Wire, which is providing sort of the earliest reports that I've seen in terms of the content of the 12th five-year plan. It will be very important and interesting to see as these get defined and rolled out and we will get more information, but the direction now appears to be very positive in terms of uh, the, fi uh, the, the future direction sustaining the effort that has been made on energy efficiency in the 11th five-year plan. Many of the things that were identified in the 11th five-year plan are still in the process of being implemented, and this, I think, is an indication that those efforts, such as the expansion of the government procurement, 
they are stronger standards in terms of light on, on labels, moving towards a gasoline tax, uh, that these kinds of measures that haven't been fully implemented, it sounds as if the commitment is being made to continue these activities in the future. I'm going to uh, finish up uh, with, some of, uh, with some projections that have been made uh, by the China Energy Group uh, that uh, Mark Levine showed at the presentation in Asilomar because it looks to me as if uh, that is a significant part of the, uh, of the program that's being considered today. Uh, they have developed a model uh, on China's Energy Group that's fairly extensive, and it, you can find that on the China Energy Group webpage. Uh, and this is an effort that they've made in terms of the, looking at what they anticipate the changes will be over the next period of time. Continued improvements are expected, uh, and with accelerated improvement, uh, accelerated attention to energy efficient, this is the forecast that they're, they're looking at. Um, with uh, the, uh, the different colors representing the blue is uh, industrial, uh, the, uh, the uh, um, yellow is, uh, I think, transportation, and the others are uh, buildings, residential and commercial buildings. So you can see that uh, uh, they peak out a little bit earlier according to the information that that uh, they are uh, using, finding from their models, and this uh, provides some information in terms of how, in their projections, their model, they think the, these changes would be taking place. These include the saturation effects, uh, slowdown in urbanization, lower population growth, and change in exports to high value, uh, to high value added products. Uh, so this is, uh, an, an overview of uh, the energy efficiency history, the measures that are being undertaken, and the anticipated future uh, in, in China. I think uh, I would uh, say that um, this uh, conference that CSIS is called is critical because it shows the key dominating role that China's policies will have. Uh, on uh, global climate change and the future. Uh, I think the information on energy efficiency shows that the energy efficiency contribution to those improvements has been very significant in the pattern that we've seen in the past and will be very significant in the future uh, if it is, continues to be aggressive, assertive, improving pulling the pieces together and combining them into uh, the kind of significant uh, accomplishments in terms of reduced greenhouse gas emissions, improved energy efficiency, <clears throat> coupled with a strong economic development that's based upon the economic attractiveness of moving in that direction. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, John. And you, you set the stage for some dual, dueling modeling uh, projections when uh, Zhang Gejun presents uh, his results in a little while. So we'll have to compare those charts. Um, the final speaker for this panel uh, is Zhao Mei Tan. With, uh, she is now a senior associate with the International Financial Flow and the Environment Program at World Resources. One of the topics that is discussed um, continually here in, uh, in Washington is the process for technology development. How do we bring technologies into the marketplace? So we thought it would be important for Xiaomi, building on some of the work she's done, to give us some insights into the approach China has taken to develop uh, new technologies. So Xiaomi. One second.
hard. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I will provide you an overview, overview of the strategies China take um, to improve its R&D and innovation in energy technology. The goal is to highlight how governments in developing countries can craft effective energy technologies against the backdrop of a pending international climate agreement, which is uh, expected to deliver financing for clean technology transfer and de deployment. In the past decades, China has uh, taken a number of measures to create an enabling environment for clean technology R&D and uh, innovation. Today, I would like to especially highlight four uh, approaches China takes. One is to establish a medium to long-term science and technology national plan and formulate short-term technology development plan. Rapidly grow R&D um, funding by the central and the local governments. Finally, is to promote international cooperation. In January 2006, China published a mid to long-term science and technology national plan. The plan established the central government's um, front and center role in determining the direction, quality, and quantity of China's R&D and innovation efforts through 2020. The plan set up four quantitative, tar quantitative targets and five strategic focuses. Under these targets and focuses, there are 11 key fields and 68 uh, priority subjects. Um, out of the five focuses, we can see the top um, focus is devoted to developing technologies in energy, water resources, and environmental protection. Based on this national science and technology plan, the Energy Bureau of NDRC formulated a mid to long term energy development plan which is totally focused on energy sector. We can see by 2020, China's goal, China's energy plan set up two key projects. One is to exploit and develop large scale oil, gas, and CBM fields. Two is to build large scale and advanced PWR pressurized water reactor and high temperature gas cooled reactor. Both projects, we can see the goal is to um, reduce China's dependence on falling energy and increase energy security. <coughs> In addition to this mid to long term national science plan, um, the government also make short term technology development development plan, which correspond to China's five-year um, five plan. We all know that China has a five-year plan. For example, the 11th five-year science and technology national plan um, uh, set up a short-term goals and targets for China's science and technology development from 2006 to 2010. Right now, China is developing, um, is constructing 12 five-year science and technology plan. And the plan is led by Wang Gang, who's the Minister of Science and Technology, advised by a group of experts. The experts come from different sectors of China, of, uh, in China. And uh, um, simultaneously, China is also developing this uh, five, 12 five-year energy development plan, which is being finalized. According to a latest issue of Liao Wan Zhou Kan, which is Outlook Weekly, uh, we can see that this energy focus has five strategic um, centers. One is to develop new energy industries. New energy industry, it uh, includes all the renewable energy and also nuclear energy. Nuclear is uh, considered a new energy source in China. Second is st strengthen traditional energy industries, which means China wanna um, create some large scale energy bases and further develop large scale energy power generation and power transmission enterprises. Try to create economy of scale. Third is to improve energy security. Energy security is a focus of 12 five year energy plan. Uh, according to our expert Zhou Fengqi, who's the former head of energy, um, energy bureau of NDRC, he pointed out that China now um, 
51% of China's oil relied on imports. This is way higher than the normal 40% uh, dependency rate. So China want to further reduce its uh, dependence on foreign oil. So energy security, improve energy security is a focus of 12's five-year plan. And the fourth focus is enhanced technology innovation. Fourth is to improve the electricity provision conditions of rural and urban residents. In addition to a long-term and short-term science technology national plan, uh, China also dramatically increased its R&D spending. We can see from 1998 to 2009, the R&D spending, the, the speed of the increase is dramatic. Um, the, the yellow bar represents public spending and the green bar represents total gross spending, which include both private and public spending. This is, a, we can see an important trend is that the private spending actually is increasing quickly. Um, in 1998, we can see that the total spending is pretty much, the government spending took, uh, accounted for a significant part of China's gross Gross, uh, gross spending. Now to 2009, this uh, um, private spending almost accounted for half of the total China's um, gross spending in R&D. Um, at the same time, China's R&D intensity also keep growing. Uh, we can see that 2009, the intensity is slightly lower than 2008, but we expect that in 2010, or in 2010, this intensity will dramatically increase because according to the um, 11th five-year science and technology plan, by 2010, China's R&D intensity is expected to get reach 2%. So in order to reach that goal, the spending we expect will dramatically increase in 2010. <coughs> so, um, the government spending um, is, we can, we can uh, distinguish them by central government spending and local, many provincial government spending. We can see that the provincial government has also scaled up its spending in R&D. Um, in 2007, the first time totally uh, provincial government spending surpassed the central government spending. In 2008, Guangdong province topped the nation. Its R&D spending in terms of the absolute number is the highest. Um, but in terms of R&D intensity, Shanghai topped the nation. Shanghai, um, almost 5% of China, Shanghai's R&D uh, GDP is devoted to science and technology. Um, China, um, manages and uh, uh, spend its R&D spending through different government programs. Here I would like to introduce the four major programs. The first is A63 program, we also call the uh, National High Tech R&D program. Second is National Natural Science Fund. This fund is mainly devoted to uh, life science and engineering. The third is key technologies, R&D and R&D program. This is more focused on technology deployment. And the fourth is 973, which we call the National Basic Research Program, which is focused on basic research. A63, we can see in 2008, the total spending in A63 programs was 795 million. And among them, 10% went to energy-related research. Um, during the 11th five-year plan, A63's energy focus, um, many focus on hydrogen and fuel cell, energy efficiency technology, clean coal technology, and renewable energy technologies. This focus changed as China um, entered the six, uh, 12th five-year plan. The 973 program, which focuses on basic research, um, the spending in basic research in China is much less than what spent in applying the science. This has a long-term effect in China's technology development, which we can, um, we can discuss later if you are interested. But uh, we can see in 2008, the total spending in uh, 973 program was only uh, 292 million, which is only one third of the spending in A63 program. Uh, among them, 11% is devoted to um, energy research. And there are also a number of energy focus that's what 973 should focus on related to energy. 
um, finally, I would like to um, highlight another approach is to um, promote international collaboration. In November 2007, the most, the most is the Ministry of Science Technology and NDRC jointly launched the International Science and Technology Cooperation Program. The, the launch of this program has, has two purposes. One is to diversify the China's, um, diversify Ch the sources of China's technology imports. The second um, purpose is to speed up the technology transfer speed between China and other developing countries. By the 2009, by the end of 2009, China has already um, signed about over, over 100 agreements, cooperation agreements with 97 countries. We can see that China's cooperation with international partners also has focused their five technology focuses. So in addition to these four approaches I introduced, the government also made other approaches such as um, encourage the private sector increase spending in R&D and also encourage technology export, encourage uh, industry and academia research synergy. So finally, I would like to, because of time, I'm not going to detail those approaches. Finally, I would like to um, conclude my presentation with three points. One is to make a deliberate, holistic plan and long-term commitment to innovation and technology de development. Second is to establish direct R&D funding programs to support energy technology innovation. Third is to rely on international cooperation to pursue new, new to market technology and knowledge. That's it, thank you. Well, thank you, Xiaomei. Um, okay, so now that you've uh, listened to some excellent presentations, we have some time for uh, questions and answers. And so we have a couple of ground rules here, uh, CSIS. Uh, one, if you could please identify yourself and your affiliation when you do that. And secondly, if you can pose whatever you have to say in the form of a question, that would, would be helpful. So you can make a comment, but if it ends with a question mark, that's always uh, a good sign. So please, uh, do we have some questions from the floor? Okay, we'll start here and then take that one after that. The, the, third, the third rule was uh, if you could wait for the microphone. Sorry. <laughs> My name is, my name is, there it's working. My name is John Rickman. I'm a news reporter for the Energy Daily. This question is for Mr. Kang Wu. How would you describe the business environment in China for foreign investors, uh, energy companies into China to develop unconventional or to explore for unconventional gas? And how would you characterize the regulatory regime uh, for gas, unconventional gas development? Thank you for the question. I, I think in the, um, the uh, unconventional gas, again, uh, there is a little difference between CBM and shale gas. Uh, compared to like a conventional upstream hydrocarbons, oil and gas, this area for the CBM, for instance, the, the policy and the environment uh, it seem to be liberal and it seemed to be favorite, and the, the dozen plus companies signed contracts, signed contract with uh, <coughs> mostly COCBM and, and later with uh, PetroChina, really obtained kind of favor favorable terms. Um, however, as you can see that uh, the macro environment for the CBM development was not very uh, favorable. So it's not just foreign companies, it's also Chinese companies. That's why they didn't do very well for the, for the, for the past. And uh, I, I list a few impediments. There are more impediments. Those impediments, uh, they, they, are, they are really facing both foreigners and, uh, and, and Chinese companies. So that's why, that's, that's, that's the reason. 
uh, for, for shale gas, uh, but, uh, and, and, and for, for CBM, again, that uh, things have changed now. They have a better, better um, uh, organizational structure in China. They have a better pricing of natural gas, a little bit better infrastructure. And the government is a little eager to, uh, to treat uh, unconfident gas as a future source of supply. So uh, the, the, the horizon for CBM has been changing now, and that uh, all, almost uh, automatically uh, applied to shale gas. So in a way that uh, there, I, I believe there, there is a lot of, lots of opportunities, and compared to other uh, upstream oil gas business onshore particularly, there is a huge, there is a, how to say that, there is still uh, lots of good terms and lots of opportunities needs to be explored. And I, I think it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a good time for foreign companies to look into this area. A lot of uncertainties, but uh, probably the foreign companies and their Chinese host can help shape the, 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 the business picture uh, in this area. And, and I thank you very much. I think there's a question over... Hi, my name is uh, Peter Marsters. I'm with the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, my question is for Dr. Wu as well regarding uh, shale gas development. Um, here in the U.S., at least, I know shale gas can run into a lot of issues with water, both in terms of potential contamination as well as it requires a lot to start these wells. Um, do you see that as a potential constraint in future shale gas development in China? Well, I... I, I I want to mention the Samuel here, and he is organizing the, uh, the tenth uh, U.S.-China uh, oil and gas industrial forum just last month in uh, in Fort Worth, and there was uh, a lot of discussions in a very technical discussion in that area. I think just one thing that uh, uh, all the papers is available, right, Samuel? Uh, uh, Sam on, on that uh, the DOE uh, website. So it's, uh, it's a lot of discussion about, uh, including the, the, the your questions. I, I think it's still too early uh, to uh, to say that uh, that that is the issue. Um, uh, Many because uh, shale gas has just barely started in in China. The, the good thing is uh, they are uh, so far the um, exploration areas like Tarim Basin and Sichuan and. Um, and other areas, uh, uh, they are, they are, well, they, they're kind of remote area, and they are, they, they are uh, the investors are big companies, a little bit different from the U.S. The big companies, the CNPC, uh, Central Pack, and now maybe CNARC and, uh, uh, and 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 other companies, and and the foreign partners also kind of mostly majors. So they are. It seems it seems that unlike unlike you know the other um, small developments in, in China, or even CBM. I think shale gas, they probably have a better technology sort of, uh, um, um, how to say, technology, uh, e equipment better with technologies to deal with the water issues. Uh, I don't think that there is, is, is a problem yet because it, it is barely started. They need to fund the shale gas first and before they can even uh, consider those issues. So development stage is still a, a later stage. I, I think it will, the issue may come up later, but, but right now they are busy just funding and even proven the reserves of shale gas in China. Okay. So we have one here and then one followed by. <clears throat> My name is Martin Apple from the Council of Scientific Society Presidents. This is for Dr. Shomei Tan. Um, you talked about China is trying to get a 2% of its GDP as R&D. Um, and it's reaching towards that. It's R&D, I mean, it's GDP is growing at, let's round numbers, 10, 12% a year, whatever, every year. So that means R&D must be increasing 15% or whatever or more every year. Um, you showed us that they were only spending $263 million for basic science in all those areas. Um, what's the purchasing power parity of that number and how fast is that going to grow? The number I showed you um, was uh, um, 2009 spending in a 973 program. Yeah. That's 290, uh, 282 million dollars. So I don't understand exactly your question, uh, Yuming. <coughs> the, the purchasing, 
the purchasing, purchasing power parity of that number. In other words, uh -huh. a dollar spent in, ch in China is, is the equivalent of what, $5, $10 spent in the United States? Oh, the conversion rate I use is $1 equal to 6.5 yuan. No, 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 no. Purchasing power parity is not uh, PPP? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you can talk about that uh, sort of on the side. A question back there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Christopher Krauss. I'm from the National Environmental Education Foundation. Um, on the topic of water, uh, Kate, I was wondering if maybe you could uh, talk a little bit about the um, sort of AP1000, the new reactor. How does uh, how, how much water does it need, and how does that compare to traditional reactors? Yeah, it, it's roughly the same currently as traditional reactors, although we are trying to examine opportunities for dry cooling and more efficient cooling technology. So right now, the standard plant does not require any particular cooling technology. So it's dependent upon the site requirements. So if there's available water, then you know you could have a standard open cycle, <coughs> a regular cooling tower, or you could have closed cycle with a hyperbolic cooling tower. It just depends on what the site characteristics are. But there is not right now a set of criteria associated for a reduction of the amount of water per kilowatt hour gener generated. So it's roughly the same as Gen 2 plants right now. If, if I could follow up a little bit on the, the nuclear question. The buzz in the nuclear sphere in the US now are small modular reactors. Um, to what extent is this an interest area, either from the, the companies you interact with as, as Westinghouse and looking at the other nuclear companies or from the innovation point of view? Uh, is there much interest in that in China? Or is the growth such that it's really large reactors that are, will, will be needed for the future? Well, I think that's a, it's an interesting question combined with the water question, recognizing that um, if you have lots of sites right along the major water sources or along the ocean, um, then s traditional cooling technologies are fine. But if you go to inland sites, um, either the grid will not support a large 1,000 or 1,700 megawatt plant, um, or there's not cooling capacity for it. And so uh, China is, is looking at smaller design, but it is a, a growth issue. Where they need the growth mostly is where there's also water availability, um, and, and so larger <laughs> plants are making sense. Generally, though, um, small modular, modular reactors are really interesting to do a couple of things. One is to be able to um, repower, and I use that in quotation marks, recognizing that when in the United States or in Western Europe when we're going to repower a fossil unit, take it off for environmental reasons or because there are myriad of them are built in the 50s and 60s. And so as you begin to roll those off the grid, you need something that's roughly the same size, megawatt hour production size, so that you can essentially level that site and put a new power system there. So you use the site, you use the water intake structure, potentially the transmission system. Um, so um, modular reactors could potentially extend the footprint of carbon-free um, electricity production. And so they're very interesting from that perspective. Mm -hmm. So one of the challenges, though, will be as you get into lower megawatt electric sizes, the economy of scale curve begins to curve up. So you need, you know, you still need a lot of containment. You need lots of concrete. So can you, by um, building everything in the factory and shipping fully made modules to site, can you flatten that economy of scale curve at those lower um, megawatt electric ratings such mm -hmm. that you could, you know, get within striking distance of existing nuclear plant installed capacity prices, but go to a construction schedule that's much more similar to a combustion combined cycle. So if you could get to an 18-month construction, then you're making electrons a lot faster, and those electrons are cheaper, and then you can roll that into the increased capital cost. So, so I think folks are examining whether or not that's possible, and that's what you hear here in the United States driving the small modular reactor discussion. If that's possible, then that's very appealing from the carbon perspective. Question um, to Kate. Oh sure. Yes. This is, this is even better. Right. Uh, <laughs> what's the what's the biggest barrier for Westinghouse to transfer technology to China? Is the IP issue or the regulatory environment or possibly lack of human capacity? What's the biggest? Uh, uh, so, 
the barrier with respect to transferring the technology, I think largely for, for two years of negotiation, it was the negotiations over how that would work. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a long and drawn out process recognizing that um, Westinghouse needs to compete continued in the future and so we want to make sure that as we improve um, the, our ability to transfer technology to China, we don't necessarily lose our ability to compete in the future. So what are the limitations with respect to that technology transfer? Um, and right now it is based on the, the fact that there is a megawatt electric capacity limitation on the usability of that intellectual property. I know that's a confusing thing. So our plant is uh, 1117 me uh, megawatts electric. And so if that that plant size is uprated, existing IP uprated just for efficiency and can you get more out of the plant? For example, if you have colder water coming into the plant, you make more electrons per molecule of water per amount of fuel. Um, below 16, uh, below 1300, a little bit lower than that, um, that plant is, is still linked to our technology transfer. So if the Chinese can develop the next, next generation plant that is a larger megawatt size with maybe some help from us in a separate contract, then they're free to com uh, compete in the open market on that. So there were some limitations in that. But with respect to um, the challenges of transferring, you know, clearly language barriers, um, even though many folks in China sp speak English, to speak English well enough for a U.S. person who, you know, we don't speak other languages. Um, <laughs> So I can say, excuse me, and hello, experienced teacher in Chinese, because my 11-year-old is learning Chinese. But it's not as though it's a normal thing for us to speak another language. So that cultural barrier is very challenging. In addition, um, you know, talked a little bit about the skills. Um, the, the Chinese are rapidly um, educating massive numbers of capable Ex extremely capable engineers, but getting them in the pipeline and interfacing significantly enough so that they can embed the really fundamental understanding of how the technology works is, is a challenge. And so it's just that, you know, time for that interface to happen in a really um, sophisticated way. So it's a, it's a time issue more than anything else. Hi, um, I'm Damian Ma. I'm a China analyst at Eurasia Group, and this is a question for Dr. Kang Wu again. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the broader natural gas question in China. Um, you know, um, most people in China think the next decade will be the era of natural gas in China. While I broadly agree, um, they have really ambitious targets, as you said. I think the NEA said there's, they want 8.3 percent of primary energy consumption to come from natural gas by 2015, which uh, first of all, do you find that uh, find that target credible? And if it is credible, is it going to get written into the 12 five-year plan? And if it does, or if a, some uh, if a target close to that gets written in, into the next five-year plan, what would you say are the demand drivers that would produce such a consumption uh, uh, change? And is it urbanization? Is it public transport? Is it is it uh, fuel switching uh, for from coal to gas? And and you know, or is it all of the above? Thank you. Thank you for your question. I, um, I, I think that's a, the target is a bit ambitious um, because uh, from you know, one percentage increase is a big deal given the large base of the primary energy consumption in China. Uh, I, I think um, my, I, the starting point is about the same. I think China um, cited about 3.5, mine is 3.4. I think it's about the same, uh, uh, the starting point. But go to 80% in 2015, I think it's very ambitious, to be honest. And um, with every effort made to uh, do the modeling, uh, we show that by uh, maybe by 2020, uh, it can be a, about 7% in my, in my kind of uh, calculation. That even depressing the share of coal quite a bit. And um, oil is OK and um, normal growth. But um, so that, that's my, my view. And, and in terms of driver, but regardless, you know, whether it's 7 percent or 8 um, uh, percent, uh, but certainly you have a few percentage increase in a, in a share, which is uh, a lot of translating into a lot of growth. I think the drivers um, 
uh, there are many drivers. Um, um, overall, is um, the, the whole whole country needs energy, so um, uh, natural gas is underutilized. So it's certainly uh, an important source of the the growth. And then, more specifically, you know, um, because natural gas in China is still uh, partially, well, in in a, in a large extent, I still call partially, but large extent is a supply driven. So when uh, the reason they consume this much is simply the gas is not there. As uh, uh, you, you produce only so much. And importing takes time. Uh, it's happening now, it takes time. So talking about supply driven, when you relax the supply, then the, the consumption will increase. So that's kind of strange. It's not just a demand issue. It is a supply uh, kind of a relax relaxation. So talking about that, um, the China actually from three sources of the, 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 the supply, they have a better future, they have a better Kind of a, um, uh, kind of a future. Domestic production conventional is going up fast. It is uh, is in a range of 10 10 percent versus like other than this year, the oil production is about five percent to six percent thanks to uh, offshore uh, the new fields in offshore, particularly the conical Phillips uh, field and, and and other fields. But r uh, usually for the past 20 years, the, the oil production is about one percent growth. But natural gas. It's about 10 percent growth and continue to be 10 percent growth, eight to 10 percent growth for the next for the next 10, 10 years, and more. So that that one source of the supply is relaxing, relaxing, relaxing. And then you have unconventional unconventional gas we just mentioned, and imports. China started from zero like uh, 2005. So the first import importation of LNG occurred in 2006. Now it's a, it's a, it's a number five in Asia, but going up relatively fast. Then you had the first drop of gas coming from Turkmenistan. And going to like 30, uh, uh, 30 billion cubic meters, maybe by 20, 2014, 2015, reach the full capacity. So the, the supply source is 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 getting is getting there. So providing the condition, and then on the demand side is uh, is certainly you know the the government desire for cleaner fuels, and the uh, the residential sector has uh, has the room to replacing. First, number one, coal is being phasing out. LPG is LPG is being squeezed, and then industrial sector. Uh, China continue to use a lot of coal, and that is phasing out. So there's a lot of room to grow in the industrial sector. Power sector is very tough. That gas, that for the future growth of natural gas, they need a power sector. Cannot be without growth of the power sector. But competition is the most fierce there. Uh, there's, um, in the certain areas, and with government support and policy issues, there's um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in East China and uh, South China. So gas is being gradually favored in, in the power sector and it's being preferred, but not all, the, all over the country. So I will say that number one, industrial sector still, and number two, residential sector, number three, power, and coupled with overall economic growth, relaxation of the demand uh, supply. So those are the factors contributing to the higher growth of natural gas use in China. My name is uh, Sun Guoshun from the Chinese Embassy. Uh, here. Uh, I would like to ask Kate uh, a question. Uh, in your presentation, uh, you mentioned that now in China there are uh, 12 uh, operating uh, nuclear units and uh, still there are 24 under uh, construction. And uh, by 2040, there will be uh, 200 uh, uh, operating uh, units and uh, 400 under construction. So uh, what will be the total cost for uh, these 400 uh, units? And uh, what will be uh, the uh, power generating capacity? And uh, what is the proportion of uh, this uh, generating uh, or these uh, units in the Chinese energy mix. So the, the goal for the 400 gigawatts electric, the capacity is gigawatt electric, so 400 um, by, t by 2040, that, that the goal is to get to 10 percent. But, but the issue is even with dramatic growth, it's difficult to increase the percentage, obviously. So um, that's enormous. And the price will be very much dependent upon, as all these technologies are transferred to China, as I said, the next 10 units, Westinghouse will have less 
and less scope in. So as they move out, it will all be indigenous to China. So I can't speak at all to the internal Chinese price. Sorry. I think I, I think that was mostly your question. Is, was there another one? The other is about the uh, generation capacity of this 400 units. Four, 400 gigawatts electric. And uh, what uh, will be the ratio? Of 10%. Okay, we're, we're getting close. We have, uh, I've seen three hands, so if we can collect the questions quickly, so each of you ask your, uh, your questions, and then the panelists can uh, start. So one here, and there was one there, and then back in the back. Hi, uh, John Romankowitz from State Department Office of Climate Change. Uh, my question's for Nat Bullard. Um, China seems to be pretty dominant in crystal and silicon. Will they be a growing dominant force in thin film solar? And what are the dynamics there? Is it is thin film going to become more important anyway? And we because we already know, U.S. is pretty dominant in thin film. Okay, why don't, why don't you wait and we'll we'll collect uh, all the questions and then. Um, hi, Catherine Silverthorne with E3G. My question is for Kate. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to how modular construction impacts the life cycle carbon emissions? I'm wondering if centralizing the construction has an impact on the life cycle carbon emissions associated with nuclear plants. And then there was the, the lady there at the table. <coughs> we'll actually collect four, so we'll, but quick in the answers. Hi, my name is Sophie Liu, I'm a student at SAIS and also a research assistant at the Rapidan Group. Um, my question is for Kong Wu and also for Nate Bullard. Um, if you could uh, give us a little, if um, from your discussions within the industry, if you could give us a little, us a little insight into um, what you think the Chinese NOCs, uh, what their uh, driving motivations may be and their acquisition of foreign, um, of foreign equity and energy in unconventional gas and shale, uh, shale oil. Um, particularly with uh, respect to their recent equity infusion to the Eagle Ford shale um, investment. Um, there is some speculation as to whether or not um, that's purely just an equity uh, investment and just an asset diversification strategy, or if there's a long-term goal to uh, obtain uh, technology transfer for China in the long term. If you could just speak a little bit about that, that'd be really great. And then the last question. In the back, in the back. Yeah. <laughs> Christopher Payne with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, for Kate, um, by 2020, what fraction of China's uh, uranium supply will be sourced domestically? And then could you project that out to, to 2040 with supposedly 400 gigawatts electric operating? And uh, same for separative work units and uh, fuel fabrication. Okay. So why don't we start, uh, Nate, if you want to start on the, the crystalline. Sure. So the, John's question was pertaining to two technologies for, uh, for a semiconductor use in solar. Crystalline silicon is, is the most common, it's the most widely deployed worldwide and is the most widely manufactured within China. Thin films uh, is a process that is more akin to, say, spray painting on glass or a metal substrate. Produces a, a similar semiconductor surface. Uh, they are inherently less efficient and therefore take up more space per any unit of generation. China really ha has done a great deal of deployment of, or at least factory deployment of thin film. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of capital equipment was sold by the United States, uh, companies such as Applied Materials, into China to do developments of, of thin film. However, thin film is a moving target, uh, as, is, as is crystalline silicon. So, as crystalline silicon becomes cheaper and cheaper, your thin film product has to become commensurately cheaper and higher in efficiency in order to compete on a levelized cost basis. And what we found is that a lot of the manufacturers in China actually drew back from some of their thin film goals and if they had the ability to invest in their already decreasing costs in crystalline silicon would go that way. Is it going to be in the long run <clears throat> a more important part of the energy mix? Potentially. The key number is always the cost of energy generated, <clears throat> not the cost of the equipment. If there are applications wherein uh, a thin film makes more sense, such as building integrated materials, uh, or if there are places where it yields more energy because of the, the yield curve inherent in the semiconductor, given particular environmental conditions, then you can see it deployed. 
Is there going to be a technology developed sort of uh, native to China in thin film? Potentially. What we've seen so far have been adoptions of technologies that are proven on the lab bench or started to be proven in factories in Europe and the United States, deployed at scale in China. But we've also seen Chinese companies that have adopted proprietary processes from the United States on a licensing basis. So it's, there's the potential always to have a lot of deployment coming from the Chinese sector thanks to expertise in manufacturing. So I guess that would be that. Okay. Um, I, I think China's overseas uh, energy investment um, and uh, shale gas investment uh, you mentioned, uh, just want to say quickly that um, uh, all the factors you just mentioned uh, all played a role. And what, uh, what the Chinese state oil companies or national oil companies uh, going overseas, they have a lot of uh, motivations by themselves. They, um, they want to grow and getting bigger and expand themselves. And the, um, the, 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 in terms of the government uh, uh, and uh, national oil companies relationship, uh, by going overseas, uh, these state oil companies, they win very quick approval by the government mainly because of the, uh, the, the rising concern since 2000 uh, by the government on energy security. So government is concerned about energy security, and in a way that uh, national oil companies kind of take advantage of that, uh, basically. And so the, um, uh, if, if you want to do $1 billion investment inside China today, even by these state oil companies, it's very difficult. You have to wait for a long time and turf fights, and about you know approval process takes months, years, but if you go overseas, you, uh, you win very quick approval, and 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 that that's how uh, the, the internal sort of uh, uh, competition and uh, among the national oil companies. So overall, they they, they are going everywhere uh, overseas, including this uh, uh, shale gas. But this uh, shale gas and uh, and CBM uh, in a way in in Australia, coal seam gas in, in in Australia, that also has a. Uh, has the components that they want to gain experiences and gain technologies so they can do a better job at home uh, for, for China's own unconventional gas exploration. So, I mean, your points are well taken, I think, for many of your, your, elaborate, your, your, your kind of uh, uh, views. Thanks. Okay, I'll start with the uh, life cycle carbon issue. We've only started examining the life cycle um, carbon footprint of the AP1000. Um, the, the, what I can t so I don't have an answer for you, but what I can tell you is um, upwards of 10 to 15 percent of the total cost of a nuclear plant is in, is in transportation. So it's really expensive. For example, you, you send a steam generator um, from, there are a couple or three steam generator manufacturers in the world, it costs maybe a million dollars to send a steam generator somewhere. So you, it's a significant impact for the cost that doesn't speak to the carbon, but it does suggest that there is a significant opportunity financially to bring the construction of the components and the construction of the modules closer. Um, but I think that the carbon benefit is probably swamped by the reduction of resource utilization. So if you cut the amount of concrete in half, you have a significant carbon decrease in just the construction of the, of, and, and utilization of the, car, of the concrete. So we're just beginning to ask ourselves those questions. We don't have those answers. Um, on the f fuel supply issue, Westinghouse has the first core um, contract for all four of those units in China. We do not have follow-on. So the goal for China is to be completely indigenous. They currently project they're going to be continuing to source uranium from Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and some of those countries. However, they have an enormous indigenous supply of thorium. So if you look out to 2040, that's a really, really long time. Um, you have an opportunity to completely change the fuel cycle, and China is putting significant R&D money into looking at um, ultra-high density fuel, um, new cladding for fuel, and can you have completely different fuel cycles, including thorium, which would make them um, largely completely indigenous from, for the fuel source. I, I don't have that, that SMU evaluation numbers. I, can, I know what that is, though. <laughs> Great. Well, um, please join me in uh, thanking the panel for a very uh, wonderful set of presentations. 
Um, and if you have, have more questions, I hope that they will be staying um, for the, the lunch we'll have. We don't have a, a set speaker for lunch, so maybe you can seek them out. But if they want to make their escape, you might do it soon. Um, we're going to take maybe five minutes to bring Jean Kejun up and get set up. So if you want to take a, a break, we've kept you going for a long time. And then we'll resume in, let's say, five minutes. Thank you. <laughs>